hello. Hello. Well, it's been a week for us, so I'm very excited to um to record today because I need a break from the real world. Yeah. Into the, the true crime and reality TV world today. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so today. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm Savannah. I'm Alicia. And this is Burden of Proof. If I forget that one more time, Alicia might kick me off the podcast. <laughs> every single week. Every single week I forget to say it. I have to wave her down. <laughs> she's like, stop. Don't go any further. Say your name. But she's right. So. All right. Today. So you're veering off the path a little bit. I am, but not by much. So today, if you didn't read the title, we're covering the Chrisleys. Chrisley Knows Best, who were just sentenced in November. Um, and this comes out in January, so it's it's a little bit further away than when it happened, but it's not too far. You should still remember. I don't remember because I'm not a reality TV junkie. Okay. Well, for normal people, <laughs> <laughs> you'll still remember. I don't really know. Like, I mean, obviously, I've heard of them, but yeah. I I literally know nothing. Okay. Well, so today we're doing a white collar crime, civil crime. My tagline that I wrote is pop culture meets civil crime today. Ooh. So we're going to cover a little bit about who the Chrisleys are, how they got in the situation that they're in, what they were charged with, and their sentencing. Okay. Okay. So if you're like Alicia and you know nothing about the Chrisleys, let me introduce you. The Chrisley family has several different reality TV shows, all stemming from one main show called Chrisley Knows Best. And the family consists of Todd and Julie Chrisley, the parents. Two older children who aren't really involved in the show named Kyle and Lindsay. Lindsay has, Lindsay's been on some shows, but anyway. She's over it. She's not a reality TV junkie. She's Lindsay. I have my own opinions. <laughs> okay. Um, and then there are four younger children. So there are four okay. younger kids who are mo- much more involved in the show are and also have their own spinoff show. Well, two of them have a spinoff show. Okay. Are Chase Chrisley, who was 20 when the show's pilot aired, which was six years ago. So now he's 26. Savannah Chrisley, who is an icon. I love her. Also, she spells her name correctly. <laughs> so, you know, we, got, okay. we love a good Southern Savannah. We're, we're good people. Yeah. <laughs> she was 18 or 19 when the show aired and is 24 now. And their youngest brother, Grayson, who's a teenager, and the Chrisley's granddaughter, who are they're raising, and her name is Chloe. So she's really young and she's not as active in the show because she's growing up. Yeah. But still worth mentioning. She was seven when the show's pilot aired, if I'm not mistaken, and is the daughter of Todd's eldest son from his first marriage. Okay. So here's a quote from Todd about Chloe. He said, we made a conscious decision that she is our child, and she is our family member, and we're not going to be a part of anything that's going to cause her to feel less than. So that's how they feel about Chloe. Okay. Nice. Todd's mother, Nanny Faye, is also on the show quite a bit, and she is a hoot and holler. She loves to gamble and have a good time, and she's so (laughs) funny to watch. And the show follows them throughout their daily lives, laughter, and family love. It's actually, I think, a really good reality show. I like reality TV. I don't hate all of it. I just, I told you this before we started recording, that I'm old enough that I was there in the beginning when reality TV started to really gain popularity. And it always kind of especially in the beginning it felt like i'm watching a train wreck like i can't look away it's terrible like these are real people with real lives i should look away we should not watch this but then over time it started to feel more and more produced yeah and so it's not that i like hate it i don't like i'm not one of those people like i don't hate on it i get why people like it yeah but it just a lot of it feels fake and set up and and like not actually reality yeah so well i don't care <laughs> yeah and most i people enjoy don't, and i think that, that most people yeah. don't care and that's fine I've i just been... i just prefer a good old-fashioned you know drama drama peaky blinders man <laughs> i've been like a, a reality show lover but i'm very particular about what reality shows i watch i like kardashians Chrisley knows best the bachelorette i'm picky but i do like reality tv and i am me and my father specifically love the chrisleys like we will straight up watch the chrisleys all day every day 
all the time. And my dad is obsessed with this case. He's the one who just who made me cover it. He was like, you've got <laughs> you to do it. Do so, uh, which I appreciate. We've talked about it a lot. And we're not the only ones who feel this way. A lot of fans are actually upset about the sentencing that's been handed down, and they're all claiming that they're going to miss the show. I was shocked reading comments on, like, clips of the show of how many people didn't even care about the crimes that they oh, committed. They yeah. were like, yeah, I don't care. They should not lock them I up. Don't th- I don't find that shocking. I kind of did, but I think it's because of the way that the Chrisleys handled it from day one. They have never tried okay. to hide the proceedings. They they say that they're innocent. They still proclaim their innocence to today. But wow. they've always been upfront with their audience about the fact that they were going through a bankruptcy case, about the fact that they were being investigated with the fraud that they were charged with mm-hmm. from day one. So I think that I think is important as well. But this family is so dynamic to watch and they interact so interestingly with each other that it's hard to even yeah. look at them and be like, you couldn't do that. You're not capable. But they were, and they did. Fair. So. All right. Well, let's get into it. All right. Before, well, before, I'm going to say that I don't know if this is true. I'm going to say allegedly. Okay. The reason that they got caught was because that Todd was allegedly having an affair with one of his financial guys. And then when he broke it off. He turned him into the FBI. That is not, I, I did not confirm this personally. This is a, I don't know if this was confirmed or not. But. Right. But rumor has it. But rumor has it. And I don't think it matters, which is why I didn't take the time to confirm it or not. The FBI were already investigating them way before any sort of accusations were made. So I don't think it matters whether or not he was or was not having an affair and got turned in. Well, yeah. So. Okay. But that's what people are going to ask. Well, yeah, that's a juicy detail yeah. that people, I mean, that's. Yeah. And I don't think, it, I don't think it pertains. So. Okay. Todd Chrisley made his money in real estate after starting his corporation, Chrisley Asset Management, early in his career. He was essentially doing this from like early in his career until like 2012. But the problem was that they were spending a lot more money than they were making. So they were flipping houses, which can be lucrative. Only if you do it right. But not this lucrative. And he yeah. was doing it right. He was successful in this. Yeah, but I mean, like, you have to be very careful about how much you're investing yeah. in the flip. Yeah, yeah. So he, and he was really successful up until, like, the market crash. And then there was some stuff after the market crash. And here yeah. we are. So there are two issues with the Chrisley family. Tax evasion and loan fraud. Oh, that's what we're working with here. Okay. So again, they were flipping houses, spending more than they were making, and then Todd allegedly got in over his head and guaranteed a real estate investment for a project. And when that fell through, he was suddenly in millions of dollars of debt, like thirty million dollars. He was on the hook for for this project that he had backed and guaranteed. Oh, my. One of his attorneys swears that if this situation with this real estate investment had not happened, we would not he would not be here. OK, so they're saying that this is the cause. I don't believe that. But because my issue with that is that their tax issues began way before that investment happened. Basically, since 2007, they had been doing a combination of things to eva- evade paying their dues to the IRS between changing the ways they file, filing incorrectly filing late, paying late, filing jointly, filing married but separate, filing amended tax returns, filing in different states, et cetera, et cetera. (laughs) They even avoided paying estate tax in Georgia for several years while they were residing there, but that got cleaned up prior to the federal trial. Okay. So. It boggles my mind that people do stuff like that, thinking they're going to get away with it. Like, you'll get away with it for a while because yeah, it's – the bureaucracy. <laughs> it's going to take them a while to catch up. But, but we'll get there. But they're going to catch you. Mm-hmm. So I will tell you how they did what they what they ended up doing. Okay. But I'm going to break it down through the indictment. So they were charged with 12 counts altogether. And there were several different people involved. So let's talk about that for a second. The main conspirators 
for this whole thing mm-hmm. is Todd, Julie, a I think he's technically like a CPA, like a, an accountant, an a accountant. tax guy okay. named Peter Tarantino. Okay. No relation. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Quentin, get your brother under control. <laughs> one guy that is not named. It's co-conspirator A and in the indictment. Oh. It was established at the beginning of the indictment that the grand jury on the case was told of who he was and his involvement, but he had immunity. So he's not listed. Assuming with that that he yes. was an FBI informant. Gotcha. Just out the gate. Which, by the way, not the same guy that he was having an affair with, allegedly. Because that guy, we know his name, pretty sure. Anyway. Okay. So. The charges, all 12 of them, not all of them got all 12 of them. Like, the last two charges was just for Peter. Julie got some that Todd didn't get. But I'm just going to break them all down. Okay. Okay? So, count one, it's conspiracy to commit bank fraud. I'm going to read the quote from the indictment here. It's number 16 on the indictment, if you're reading it. (laughs) It's public record. You can easily, easily find it. Beginning at least as early as 2007 and continuing in or about 2012, the exact dates unknown, the Northern District of Georgia and elsewhere, the defendants Todd Chrisley and Julie Chrisley did knowingly and willingly combine, conspire, confederate, agree, and have a tactic understanding with each other and co-conspirator A to execute a scheme and articulate defraud multiple financial institutions, the deposits of which were insured by the FDIC or Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and to obtain money, funds, and credits owned by and under the custody and control of the aforementioned financial institutions by means of materially false... Materially and false... I I was doing so good. I was doing so good. I can read. Materially false and fraudulent pretenses, representations, and promises by omission of material facts in violation of Title 18 United States Code Section 1344. Okay. I did pretty good. Yeah, well, that's a mouthful, so... So, what does that mean? Yeah. That means they were conspiring, planning, and scheming to lie to financial institutions or banks in order to get loans or funds. They were insured by the FDIC, which kind of is part of the reason that makes this a federal case. Right. Okay. Everything good? Making sense? I think so. Cool. So, here are some things that are supposed to prove that conspiracy. They list further down. Okay. Basically, co-conspirator A sent an email to Todd attaching a personal finance statement that falsely claimed that Todd had $4 million at Merrill Lynch. When the bank employee requested account statements, conspirator A sent Todd Chrisley a fabricated bank statement saying that he had seventy-seven, over $77,000, dollars on deposit at Merrill Lynch. Blah, 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 blah. None of this is true. He never had more than like $17,000 in the account. When they asked for more statements, Todd Chrisley told co-conspirator A, quote, you are a fucking genius. Just make it show $4 million plus. Again, they had $17,000 in the account. So, basically, they said, we need updated paperwork. And then he said, make it happen. I, I don't so, yeah, I mean, like, that's conspiracy. I, yeah. <laughs> that's planning to lie to a bank. Yeah. In another example, again, a bank asked for updated paperwork. Co-conspirator A said, we don't have said paperwork to Todd. And Todd said, quote, stop telling me this shit. Create them like you always have. If I don't get these, then they want blank renew the loans. It's a quote, so it's kind of blocky. Like it's missing words from whatever source that the indictment got it from. But basically, he's saying, do it. (laughs) Make it happen. Yeah. Um, Create them like you always have. Yep. And later he says, giving an excuse to why you cannot figure this out does not move it off your plate. This is not what we discussed. Passing it back and forth is not getting the result requested. If you don't know how to do it, then find a crooked accountant to do it. Ask Redacted who her guy uses for his crooked shit. Is Redacted in trouble too? No. As far as we know. What? So I think you get the idea. Oh boy. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so, that's okay. Yeah. Also listed in this charge is when it became apparent to banks that the Corporation for Chrisley's Asset Management was insolvent or out of money, as we like to say. 
Mm -hmm. um, and they couldn't get any more loans from that. Then Todd and Julie threw co-conspirator A under the bus, saying that they didn't know he was submitting false documents. They signed a sworn affidavit in August of 2012, falsely asserting that the co-conspirator had used their accountant stationery without the consent of Todd and Julie. Wow. However, three months prior, Todd had emailed co-conspirator A and said, quote, can you place this on the accountant's letterhead with his signature and then sign Julie's name below the accountant's address and address the letter to whom it may concern? <laughs> for me, it's the audacity. <laughs> it's the audacity for me. Uh, yeah, it's like straight up a lie. And you <laughs> lied on a sworn affidavit. You just said, oh, no, we didn't know. And then here's proof of you telling him. Oh, my gosh. To do exactly what you said he didn't. you didn't know he did. Wow. Okay. So. That's count number one <laughs> of conspiracy. Okay. It's hard when it's conspiracy because you're like, yeah, but he did it. So is it conspiracy? The difference between conspiracy and the count of defrauding bank mm -hmm. <laughs> is that they are just proving that he had planned to do it. Right. Then counts two through six are actually proof that it, they followed through on it. those plans. Yeah. So counts through two six are on or about June, July. July, August, October, August from 2009 to 2010. Okay. Um, and it's basically providing false financial statements to Midtown Bank, false financial statements to Gulf South Private Bank, false financial statements for United Community Bank, false audit paperwork for RBC Bank USA, and then false personal finance statements for Wells Fargo. <laughs> now you may ask, <laughs> how does one provide false bank reports? Mm-hmm. It's all done through something called scrapbooking. So basically, they're taking bits of pieces of correct documents, bits and pieces of fake documents, and putting them together to resemble their preferred version of events. Right. For example, taking a statement with all the correct banking information and then adding in some falsehoods about what's contained in the account. Right. Like, I don't know, making it look like there's $4 million in an account when there's $17,000 in the account. I mean, I don't know. I'm just guessing. Could be something like that, though. <laughs> All that keeps going through my mind is, like, I've been on a really big saving kick. Yeah. And I, by no means am I bragging by this, but, like, I don't, I don't consider Matt and I, like, super wealthy or, like, obviously, like, we live in a fixer-upper. We're, like, slowly yeah. fixing things up. So we, we live very, very modestly. And, in fact, last week, one of our kids said, we really live like we're poor. <laughs> Even though we're not, and Matt said, yeah, that's why we're not poor, yeah. because we live like we're poor. But I'm just sitting here thinking the whole time, I have more than $17,000 <laughs> in my savings account, and these people are managing, like, million-dollar deals. Yeah. It's like, what? Yeah. I can't wrap my brain around yeah. that. That's crazy. Yeah. They didn't have that much money. <laughs> uh, Yep. Okay. So, <laughs> with the help of the co-conspirators, Peter and the co-conspirator, Sir A, they did things like the scrapbooking to secure loans that they either use for personal use or to help pay off other loans. <laughs> loans on loans on loans until they couldn't get any more loans. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> no. Okay. Again, for me, the audacity. It's the audacity. So. I don't know. It was really telling for me to read those quotes in count one of him just telling him what to do. And I'm like, oh, so you want to make it out like you don't know what's going on. But here you are yeah. saying exactly what's going on. Yeah. So count seven is wire fraud or it's wire fraud conspiracy. Excuse me. Again, okay. with the conspiracy fraud first. Right. Basically the saying that Todd and Julie intentionally lied or knew that they were going to be committing the wire fraud and that it was planned. They intentionally sent fabricated or scrapbooked documents to a California property owner in order to secure a lease on a massive California rental home. Even after they terminated their relationship with the co-conspirator in 2012, they continued to send these fabricated documents. And again, I want to be very clear that at this point, they are literally cutting out numbers and putting them on other documents with tape and glue. And then, like, I'm assuming scanning them in to make them look legit. 
But this is like arts and crafts type deal here. <laughs> okay. Because that made it a little bit more like humanized to me. I was like, can you imagine Todd and Julie and Chris <laughs> at their <laughs> kitchen table <laughs> with scissors? Like cutting out numbers from one document and then carefully putting them on another document oh, and like Lord. holding it up and being like, yeah, that looks okay. Scan it in. Yeah. Make sure there's not that little line. black line yeah, around right it. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Exactly. So they did that with um, the bank statements and they actually did it with um, Julie's credit reports as well to <laughs> secure this house. And then, of course, only months after moving into this falsely secured home, they didn't pay their rent and were threatened with eviction. Count eight was the wire fraud for the home since they had given fake information. Of course, the wire deposits weren't working correctly. Yes. Can I pause you Absolutely. to ask a question? Okay. So because I'm not a watcher of the show, when was this all happening? Like when they started their show or they or, this was all yeah. before the show? It's a, it basically... The show aired, oh gosh, hold on, I should know that answer. Hold on. Yeah, 2014. So this was in 2012 when they secured the okay. California home. Okay. And then in 2012, after a lot of this stuff started happening, they were approached by producers who wanted to produce a sizzle reel or like a basically like a little pilot episode to send okay. off to some agencies because somebody basically just found them and thought this would be a good show. So they sent it off to 10 production, like to 10 agencies or 10 networks, and nine of them came back with offers. Wow. People knew right away that this was going to be successful. And it was. Yeah. They have Chris Lino's Best. They have Growing Up Chris Lee, which is Chase and Savannah moving to LA and like spreading their wings. Savannah has a podcast. Chase does real estate. Todd and Julie have a podcast. Todd had just signed a deal for a, a dating show. Julie's done um, a cooking website, a cooking web series. Like, they've done a ton of stuff. Wait, Todd, the husband, mm -hmm. was going to do a dating show? Like, what? Yeah. Like, he's going to host it? Yeah, he was going to host okay. it. Okay. Okay. I was like, he's married. No, what? <laughs> no he was going to host it. Then again, a he might have been show. having an affair. So, who knows? He was going to host a dating show. Okay. And gotcha. it was supposed to air next year, but I think that it's been canceled now. Not for sure, though, because well, they've already taped some episodes for season 10 that had been renewed and now they're going to jail. So they're going to release those later in the year just for funsies. They can just like start follow them in jail. Honestly, that not might be plan. even more exciting. For real. <laughs> so I apologize for not explaining that. If you want to move it, you can, but I don't, well, I don't know how. No, that's fine. Anyway, it'll work. Yeah. So the reason all, I the reason I did it is before. because I'm going to explain it in count nine. <laughs> so. Okay. Of where, Sorry. yeah. I got ahead. No, no, but you're right. It's confusing. So that was, they basically started that process around 2012 and it aired in 2014. Gotcha. So again, count eight was the wire fraud for the home. Count nine is conspiracy to defraud the United States. This is all about them taxes. Like I said earlier, the entire time they're evading taxes from multiple states. This charge talks about how the Chrisleys were attempting to hide the incoming fronts from their new hit reality show by having those checks deposited into a company that was made in Julie's name that listed her as the CEO and not Todd. Seven C's production had Julie's name on it, which meant that technically, since her name was not on the taxes that Todd had defaulted on, uh, you see? Yes. That's how they were going to avoid the IRS realizing that they had more money taking, was because yeah. the taxes that he had defaulted on mm -hmm. were not in her name. The yep. whole filing separately or jointly but married or jointly but separately was done for a reason. It was so that they could keep Julie's name out of it. So when they did start making money, they didn't have to pay taxes on if it was going to Julie. Yeah. So all of this with Seven C's production company was done to avoid having to pay those overdue taxes. And it doesn't help that the day they realized the FBI was investigating them, they changed the Seven Seas production account name from Julie's name into Nanny Faye's name. <laughs> what the hell? Why would you? Basically, what oh they did God. was they literally, they went, they changed her name on the account. They drafted a letter changing the board of directors from Julie's name to Faye's name, all while knowing that in reality, Faye was not going to have anything to do with the 
board of productions for Seven Seas. Who would actually buy that? Having worked with the with the old the elderly, the elderly in estate planning, who in their right mind would believe that anybody else would believe that some 70, 80 year old woman is putting more assets into yeah. their name before they become senile or die. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and she wasn't charged. So either the IRS was like, this isn't worth our time, or they found it through their discovery process that genuinely right. she's not at fault for this, which is what I kind of think happened. Well, based on the little clips you showed me of Nanny Faye, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you just probably went along, oh, okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yes. This count, count a nine, also covers how their co-conspirator Tarantino was intentionally impeding the IRS, misleading them at every turn, lying about regular things like information that he should have known he said he didn't know. Or saying they were asking questions about this side or the other, and then he would tell Todd, well, I just ignored that. I just didn't answer that question, which is impeding the IRS. <laughs> yes. And he was, again, amending tax forms for them and filing amended tax forms to avoid all of this. And then count 10 is the tax evasion. It covers a lot of things that we talked about previously, changing how they filed and the execution of the plans for conspiracy to con for the tax forms. Right. Again, with the seven seas production. Count 11 and 12 are both against Peter Tarantino, aiding in filing false tax returns. So again, those right. two were pretty much just directly at him. So, spoiler alert, they were found guilty. Shocking. I am honestly not even going to cover a lot of the trial stuff because from what I saw, a lot of it was them just going, we didn't know, we didn't do it, it's their fault. Um, and pushing the blame onto other people for things and claiming that they just didn't know what was happening. And well, we clearly can see otherwise. And then they were, there you was. You can't gaslight the court. <laughs> but you sure can try. It's called defense. My goodness. Well, that's not funny. I don't mean that for sure. For real. But. Not always. It's not, not always. always. Yeah. But yeah, when you don't have any option, I, I've said it before. I'll say it again. Like, I know defense attorneys in most cases get, like, this terrible rap because yeah. they're d defending criminals. But on a serious note, it's my understanding that they do so just because they strongly believe in the process, yeah. in, in due process, and everybody gets a fair trial, and, and that's wonderful. But I actually feel bad for them when they're handed a crap case yeah. and, like, what defense is there? Yeah. Like, and and even if you're working for them. So even if you say, dude, just come clean, make a deal. Like, <laughs> yeah. If they decide that they want to try and gaslight the court. Yeah. See how that you goes You just for have you. to do your best. <laughs> like, like, I don't know. Spoiler alert in this case. Didn't work. No. Um, they were found guilty. They were sentenced in November of this year of 2022, okay. which I guess technically would be last year because this is coming out in January. And we're recording it in December. Yes. Anyway, Todd was sentenced to 12 years. Julie was sentenced to seven years. And Peter was sentenced to three years. All of them are serving in minimal, minimum security federal prisons. Mm -hmm. um, I think Todd's going to be in Pensacola. And Julie's going to be in Tallahassee, both of which are supposed to be pretty chill as prisons go. It, well, I mean, yeah, yeah. White collar crimes tend to... Yeah, they plan on appealing and state their innocence. I think the reason that they're in such chill prisons, too, is, well, I say not no prison is, is chill. Let's be clear. It's prison. It's well, still hard. Yeah. But, you know, there are some that are worse than others. But they're not violent. They're not going to hurt anybody. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. Like, they so, try to put the, the nonviolent people yeah. together so that you don't, you're not, you know, going to prison, I'm sure, is traumatic on some level for everyone for everyone for any case no matter what but yeah i mean can you imagine if they start sticking nonviolent people in with oh my gosh. people well in orange like, is the new black they kind of did and it didn't end well anyway yeah <laughs> um so yeah it's by all means for everybody involved it's really hard and um i just two things really quick before we wrap up a, I know this is a short episode. It's like 30 minutes, mm. maybe less, depending on what we cut. It is. But 
there was obviously a lot more drama that got involved with like their kids and blah, 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 blah. I didn't see that any of that was necessary. My goal was seriously to break down what they actually got charged with because when you Google it, they're just like tax fraud, tax evasion. Yeah. And nobody knows what that means. And that's kind of why we're here as a podcast is to break down the legalities of that. Yeah. And so it was really fun for me to go through the court documents and kind of find the important stuff for you guys and for you to kind of explain for me what they did. I didn't even know who they were. <laughs> yeah. But still, um, so there's I'm sure that there's more that I missed, but I thought that this covered the basics and yeah. kind of broke down the white collar crime industry <laughs> industry into bite sized pieces. That was kind of the goal with going through the indictment. So I hope yeah. that I did that well. Um, and I apologize if you feel that I left anything that was important out, but I tried to make it into manageable pieces for people who don't know anything about civil crime. Well, yeah. If you have questions, just yeah, talk to us yeah. on Facebook, Instagram, all of the things. Not Twitter, though. I don't like Twitter. <laughs> Secondly, there is obviously the question of the minor kids. Yeah, I kind of, well, I thought about it, but I didn't want to interrupt a second time. So, Oh, you're fine. Uh, the answer is that Savannah has stepped up and said that she is happily going to be taking custody of her younger siblings, Grayson and Chloe. Wow. Um, she is tr- truly, though, I do really like Savannah. I think that she's a really classy lady. Client. And she is just, I mean, she's freaking beautiful. She's always been gorgeous. Um, and she has podcasts, which she has spoken out about her parents' feelings on going to jail. And they're very upset and... You know, obviously they're nervous, but Julie has said that this has made their marriage stronger and blah, 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 blah. So that's interesting to me as well, considering the allegations of an affair. (laughs) I don't know these people, so (laughs) I don't, I haven't watched the show, so I don't, but being married 18 years, like, I don't know. I kind of feel like that makes sense yeah because if you're going to co be co-conspirators and yeah. stuff like you're in it together you're in it together yeah. we got to stick together no i agree what. i agree i am curious to see how savannah and chase use this to kind of promote their little chrisley empire because i totally think that they could still be super successful i don't think that this yeah, has ruined I, anything for them yeah even decades ago yeah I think that it could have had a much more negative impact on them. But in today's world, I think that most people have lost that stigma of like, oh, there's shame on the family name kind of thing. And so it's very easy, especially with Gen Xers and Gen Zs, millennials, sorry, sorry, millennials. (laughs) It's because we're Gen X and Gen Z that I just kind of skip skip over, skip over millennials, but a little bit with my generation of Gen X. And well, and technically I'm a Zennial, but whatever. Millennials and Gen Zs, I think that there is very much that movement of like we are not our families. Yeah. I agree. And so And I think there's a big difference now in yes, cancel culture is rampant and if you do one thing, you could lose your entire career. I personally think that cancel culture typically is a good thing. I think a lot of times, it, I mean, it rats out people who have done horrible things. But I know, yeah. I'm sure that their thought was, this is our livelihood. Oh, yeah. It would be scary. I mean, not only yeah. are you dealing with the trauma that just that would bring, like, oh, my mm-hmm. God, our parents are, I'm assuming that they didn't know anything about it. Yeah. Even if they knew something about it, it wasn't necessarily, like, they're, they're children. Like, what? Yeah. what are you, you know? I mean, I know now they're adults, but even when you're young adults, like you, you still look at your when parents, you trust like, your parents yeah. to be doing the right thing. So I am in no way, shape, or form faulting them or saying like, oh, they should, have, you know. I get it, but you're already going through that traumatic, yeah, business of just having that happen, and then on top of it, this is the world you've entered. Mm-hmm. Like I'm assuming, based on what you've said, these kids weren't like oh, you should go to college and find this other career. Like, it sounds like they were young adults. Yeah, no, they did. They They, they did their own thing. And then, I mean, they're doing their own thing. You said he's in real estate. Yeah, she did pageantry for work for a little bit. She does a lot of philanthropy stuff. But I think she went to college for another thing. Okay. But I I don't remember for sure now. Well, I mean, I 
that's great. So then you have like a backup, you yeah. know, like if if your podcast is affected, if your real estate business yeah. is affected, then you have that backup. But still, that's devastating because you've worked really hard to get that for yourself. Yeah. Aside from your parents. And- but I think that they will be fine. Um, it was a it's it's I'm so fascinated by them going to jail. Like it's I can't wait to see how it plays out in the long run. Like you'll catch me 12 years. Because he'll serve a lot of that because it's federal prison. So at the very minimum, I think he's going to be doing eight is what I heard. Yeah. Even if he's on his best behavior, um, he'll be serving like eight to ten of that for sure. And Julie will probably serve between five and her full sentence of seven years. So I'll be very curious to see what happens as they come out. I'll be very curious to see if they stay married. I'm Because it's reality TV. I'm invested in their lives. And I know that parasocial relationships are a whole thing. But also, I'm nosy. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah on a non-legal note fascinated by the situation and on a legal note because i mean yeah i think that this is a a, a thing where our generation as a gen Zer, is this is i think maybe one of the first times that a white collar crime has been in the news media where we have such like widespread access to what happened yeah. it's probably not the first but it's definitely one of the ones that it's it's pretty much the only one I well, remember. I think it's just because of who they are and mm-hmm. you know I, I I'm sure that there has been cases but not of anybody that yeah you know is so widely popular with or yeah. known for for it's just different the, the, only, lev- the, the level only other of one. fame or popularity mm-hmm. you know the only different. other one I can think of is Black China suing the Kardashians. But even that, I think, was kept a lot on the DL because the Kardashians are so they're so careful about their name yeah. and what's associated with them um, versus Todd, who was very upfront with everything. He made an Instagram post like before the trial or before they were named in the indictment. And he said, somebody that we were very close to has gone out of their way to blah, 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 blah. and." Yeah. In a few days, we're likely to be indicted or named in a federal indictment on fraud counts and we proclaim our innocence and blah, you know. So yeah. they were very upfront and honest about it and saying that they were innocent. Right. Which I think has definitely affected the public opinion of them. In the sense that the public is predominantly supportive of them. Yeah, I would say yes. Okay. Even even if people are saying like, yeah, they did it, but I'm going to miss them. It's yeah. not like outraged. Nobody's mad at well, them for what they well, did. Like I was telling you about podcasts. People don't care. As long as you're consistent, you got to show up. Yeah. Don't take vacation. No, we're not allowed to take vacations, except that we just did. So <laughs> <laughs> if you're still here after our vacation, it's because you, you love us. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, people have strong opinions. Don't you interrupt their lives by taking vacation or going to jail yeah and so if you're upfront and honest and say well i didn't do this and i'm gonna be here and we're gonna fight it and we're innocent and blah blah they're gonna be on your side from day one except he wasn't honest no he was not honest he lied (laughs) he was upfront. he just wasn't honest yes so but when people have those parasocial relationships where they think they know this person because they watch them on tv that used to be a running joke in my in-laws family is because my f- husband's parents, his dad and stepmom, would talk about. They always watched all the cooking shows. Yeah, and like Rachel Ray and people that they watch, they would refer to them by, by their, their first yeah. name. I do that with Henry Cavill <laughs> yeah. all the time. Oh well, yeah, we do. <laughs> we Nicholas is like, "Are you on a first name basis?" Because I'm like, "Oh well, Henry's doing this." And he's like, "You're on a first name basis with Henry Cavill." Yeah, I am. Do you have something to say about that? <laughs> But yeah, I, and, and, and Gen Z has seen it a lot, in, especially with like growing up on YouTube and growing up on the internet. Yeah. We have constant, regular, consistent access to these people oh, yeah. in their lives. And so the, the feeling of we know this person is so strong. I didn't realize how bad it was until Jenna Marbles left YouTube a few years ago. Yeah. And I like felt it like grief. Yeah. And I, I remember thinking, this is ridiculous. I don't actually know her, but I'm hurt. Like, I miss her. Yeah. And so people look at their reality TV show, and then they hear this, and they're like, no, they could never. They didn't do it. (laughs) 
I just can't believe it. I know them so well. Yeah, they I, they wouldn't do that. Yeah, it's it messes with you. Yeah, it's that interesting. Whole, for like sure. we could get how do a whole. I mean, not that we will because we're true crime, but we could the psychology of social media and and reality shows and that whole thing because you feel that way like. You and I both love to read, but you are even more of an avid reader than I am. And you get sucked into those worlds. Like, I feel like I know Jamie Fraser. Yeah. (laughs) Like, yeah, I know Claire. But I think, though, I think there's a difference, though, with fiction because they are, I think, fictional characters do. They are yours and your perception of them is yours. And you don't have to share that with other people. Well, right. But that's what I mean. That's what I was kind of getting at is that it's not as dangerous in a way yeah. because it it is a fictional character like i can make him be whatever I want yeah. in my head but like those are real people yeah that live real lives that and, you don't know and even though it seems like we're recording everything we're actually not yeah so that's a dangerous game that mm-hmm. our society plays with the whole reality yeah tv and social media business the only other thing i wanted to say before we head off today is that I think part of my fascination with like civil crime and white collar crime specifically mm-hmm. is like not necessarily in this case, but I feel like there was something else we covered recently that I absolutely understand how you get to that point where you're just like you're going and you're going and you're like, it's OK. Everything's going to be fine. If I just keep doing it, nothing's going to go wrong. And like I'm fixing it. Like it's just overwhelming in the sense of like mm-hmm. these aren't killers. They're not people with a fantasy about sling hundreds of versions right. like yeah it's so it's fascinating to me about the floundering that goes on in this situation of like you make one mistake and it's easy to make the first one and then you just keep going and then you're in too deep yeah you rationalize yeah every step of the way like Ex- d- yes either whether you're rationalizing in the sense of i know this is wrong but I'm just going to do this this one more time. I just need this one more time. It's almost like yeah. a drug. Like, or I have I to do need... this for my family. Like, yeah. they, work, they need this. They rely on me. Yes. It's fascinating to me. Yeah. Because I can so see how you get to that point. Yeah. Even the rationalization that the you said their defense team said, oh, if not for this one deal. Yeah. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here. But it doesn't really matter. Even if it was because yeah. of that one deal. They broke the law. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Period. So. Yeah. Yes. I love civil crime. Fascinates me. I know. Now I feel I feel like we should have started a podcast about <laughs> so We'll have to separate. We'll have to we'll have to be like the Chrisleys and have I multiple know. shows. I feel like that's kind of the the perk of the way that we've structured our podcast though is that even when we do more traditional true crime stuff, we still can talk a little bit about law. Yeah. And then when we want to do stuff that's a little bit off the wall like this, or like when Darrell Brooks was on trial and I wanted to do a case on it, but then just the timing didn't work out. Yeah. And breaking down what was happening in real life and like the the action by action yeah. of the legality of even though he had a criminal case. Right. The way that his played out, it really turned into a civil issue. In the gotcha. way that his was structured. Yeah. So we can kind of break it down in a little bit of a different way to anything than other podcasts can. Yeah, I agree. Well, if it you works. made it all the way to the end, thank you guys so much for thank the, you. like, so much love that we've received over the last, like, month. It has been amazing. Yes, yes. We're so happy. So excited. Yes. Thank you. Thank you guys so, so much. Thanks for listening to me talk. I feel like I just ranted the entire episode but i hope you enjoyed and if you're still here <laughs> thank you for always listening to the our awkward endings yeah we still figured this part <laughs> out have we <laughs> anyway till next time till next time bye bye thanks for listening guys find us on instagram and tiktok at burden of proof pod and email us at burden of proof pod at gmail.com